Yes, and this is the problem. So, uh, I don't think we're anywhere near the truth. No, but in 574, would not the king, the monarchy, been Gnostic? Oh, very yeah. heavy. Yeah, the people who would come to America would have been Gnostic. Christians. Very heavy into it. You could call them the Protestants of the day. We, Dr. Ray Hayes, uh, copyrighted in February of this year, the fact that based on Sir Walter Raleigh's because that's a tyranny, it's a monopoly. They're claiming a monopoly on God, and unless you come to us, you can't go to God. Mm. Uh, in other words, um, it's an absurdity. Uh, the British belief appears to have been any man can go direct to God. Um, in other words, you speak to him through prayer or whatever, yeah. in decision. And I, I don't think these ideas would have prevailed. And yeah, finally you had the collapse of, of this in Britain with uh, Henry VIII and the many wives who did it almost inadvertently, but uh, monks were running around selling uh, holy blood and, and really they were fun, and, and they had these little vials that you turned upside down and they changed colour and went red and so on, and they filled it up twice a week from goose blood or something like this and duck's blood. And uh, uh, There was enough timber pieces of the Holy Cross sold as, you know, religious amulets to make a sizable forest of several million acres, you know. And they were selling pieces of the cross everywhere. And uh, they sold indulgences and penances and pardons. In other words, you go and commit some heinous crime, and provided you paid enough, the, you got a pardon, duly signed, stamped, and sealed your pardon. Sure. And you could actually buy a pardon or an indulgence to do something mm -hmm. before you committed the crime. Oh, my. In other words, if you paid enough, you were then free to go and do it. And you had your, your, your absolution ready paid. Yeah. So the other thing was that people uh, were threatened with millions of years in purgatory, rotting and roasting in hell, but if you paid the church enough, the priests would go on singing masses yeah. for you for so many years, which would get you out of this purgatory quicker. It's a form of blackmail. One of the interesting things, Alan, the first time that you experienced a Native American ceremony was down in Columbus, mm. Georgia. Mm. And they had a ring with a fire pit with logs and a cross. They had poles out to like north, south, east, and west. And then the Native Americans all in their fancy costumes mm. lined up mm. from tall to short. Mm. Give us what you felt when you saw this. Well, they had a circle in the middle with four logs dividing, which I felt was the four quarters of earth and four right. quarters of heaven, right. which is a familiar motif right back to Chaldea, mm -hmm. and familiar in the construction of the cosmos as known in Ireland, Wales, Judea, as well, ancient uh, Sumerian lines. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing was the lining from, uh, not from old to young, but from the tallest to the shortest, I thought it was the head of a comet streaking around the earth, which again is familiar in Gnostic and world experience. Sure. Uh, the four poles are uh, the four stars, one in the belt of Orion, one in Taurus, one in Leo, and one in, I think, uh, the Eagle. And if you draw a line from these main stars to each other, they cross and intersect at mm -hmm. the pole star. Mm -hmm. Now if you were to draw that line in the heavens and see that the pole star wasn't at the point of intersection, it oh. means the earth has shifted on its axis and we're in trouble. Right. Possibly through being squished by a comet. And so what they were doing was very familiar to me. I would think and then little easy. Albert? Well, little boy came out, well, there was a man first beating on the drum, and he handed over to little Albert, who was very keen to do it, and was beating on a drum and shouting in a sort of Gregorian chant, uh, changing his tone and, in, 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 right. you know, and, and going through different uh, octaves. And he was beating a drum and shouting, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. In other words, he was shouting Jehovah as they went around. And Jehovah is the great snake, the great serpent, the great comet. So he was shouting Jehovah as oh. this great snake of people in the form of a comet with its long, dwindling tail went round and round the earth. Didn't have one of that's And it was very simple to see what they're doing. And if you read the Navajo uh, version of the uh, cosmos and solar mm -hmm. system as they see it in its formation, uh, I've managed to read a version of this. Mm -hmm. It's identical to the Druidic uh, version of the cosmos, and this can be demonstrated in Ireland, Wales, Judea, uh, and Chaldea, and perhaps in Egypt. Continuity. You know, it certainly fits right in with the legends. One other thing that was found uh, down by Cumberland River was a three-headed urn called a triune <coughs> urn, or mm. vessel. Mm -hmm. And it was in the home of 
John D. Clifford in 1820, referenced by Raffinesque and uh, uh, drawn up by uh, uh, another Atwell. Uh, Caleb Atwell actually etched it. But it had three faces going different directions. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they found a stone in mm -hmm. the up around the Newark, they had three faces on the same stone, mm. and uh, but they they have existed. What do you think that is? Well, it's, uh, clearly you know as well as I do, it exists in the land of cathedral in Cardiff. Yes. Uh, the, the, again, the Catholic Church tried to get rid of all these three faces. I don't. So you've got three faces mm -hmm. on a stone, but the the center face has two eyes, and one of those eyes attaches to the outer face, mm -hmm. and one of its eyes attaches to the other face, and there's four eyes, three faces, joined together. Uh, you've been exhibiting a little chart and map where these things are found, uh, and you find them in, in Britain, Spain, Etruria, Crete, and Malta, and back to Turkey yourself. Yes. What I notice when you exhibit these little items that are found with two or three heads joined together, mm. you don't talk about the chevrons underneath, which are on the oh, and you should have because the chevrons are a major symbol of the Glamorgan kings, mm -hmm. the Welsh and British kings, mm. kings of Britain, you might say. And uh, the chevrons, as you have said, are exhibited in Genesis with these people carrying their chevrons into battle. Mm -hmm. And yet you still have the chevrons, and you find the chevrons all over the artifacts you're finding in America. Chevrons are all over the artifacts, going from one end of uh, the other, associated with the Godhead. Yeah. Associated with the God. Certainly the king of Glamorgan would have been Arthur. Yes. And so that uh, would be very significant if it's on this continent. Yeah, the trouble with, with Arthur is, again, if you kick out all history before William the Conqueror, mm -hmm. and now the English are having the problem of resurrecting their own Dark Age history, mm -hmm. and they've only just started looking at church charters and cathedral charters of 700 and 800 and so on, and earlier, uh, the problem is, when you throw out all Dark Age history, inevitably you throw out Arthur the First and Arthur the Second. So whereas in Gibbon's Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire and numerous other manuscripts, documents that he draws upon, mm -hmm. you have a clear description of Arthur I attacking the Roman Empire of the West as chief general of his father, Magnus Maximus Mascambledi. This can't be mentioned, because how can a fictional British king descended from Trojan kings attack Europe in 383? He attacks Europe, he attacks Paris, mm -hmm. seizes the lady St. Genevieve, and yet you've got romance legends of Arthur going into Europe and attacking big cities and seizing Guinevere, it's in mm -hmm. Genevieve. Mm -hmm. You've got the, the well-known histories of Arthur fighting the Roman emperor and killing him. Mm -hmm. Yet this Arthur, Andragathius, the Romans called him, Arthur the First in 383, uh, is confronted finally by Gratian, the Roman emperor, at Soissons. The medievals called it the Battle of Sassi. Mm -hmm. According to the English, the Battle of Sassi. Soissons never occurred. According to the Romans and everybody else in the world, the Battle of Spassons did occur in 383. Gratian is defeated by Arthur, mm -hmm. who's the general for his aging father, Masca, Magnus. Gratian flees with 300 horsemen down to Leons. That's all he's got left. He's in trouble. Arthur goes chasing after him, gets down there. And uh, as you know, they have a, a little bit of a parley and a peace conference, and they decide to have a meal at a banquet together. And uh, in the middle of the banquet, having probably had enough to eat, Arthur gets up, picks up his axe, and cuts Gratian in half. And his father, Magnus, then becomes Emperor of the West. He's already got Britain and France. Spain goes over to him. All of North Africa and Egypt go over to him. Statues are erected. Arthur attacks through Spain, through Switzerland. Uh, there's a, the, the chap that Arthur still there, a pass at near Geneva. St. Genevieve, mm -hmm. Geneva, right, Guinevere. And uh, chat, Arthur means the